so now I uh, request Dr. Prashant Prabhu, who is the coordinator along with me of this program, to introduce Dr. Rajeshwari to deliver the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sriraj. So now I invite Dr. Rajeshwari ji, who is working as a professor of ENT at uh, Aish Mysore since 2008 and currently she is serving as the head of the department of ENT. She has vast experience in assessment and management of ear, nose and throat disorders. She has authored several research publications and book chapters. She has been principal investigator for several WHO and ARF projects. She has been instrumental in establishment of uh, vertigo clinic and uh, temporal bone dissection lab at AISH. And she has been a recipient of several awards and honors from different organizations too. So she is one of the experts in tinnitus and hyperacusis assessment and management. And now I invite Dr. Rajeshwari to uh, give her lecture uh, to all the audience. So I invite you ma'am for the lecture. Uh, Ma'am, uh, we are unable to hear you. Rajeshwari ma'am, we are unable to hear you. There's some technical issue, we're trying to sort it out. Participants are requested to wait for a while.
you are audible ma'am Hello, Shriram, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you are audible, ma'am. Well, good day, everybody, audience. The topic for presentation is assessment and management of tinnitus in hyperacusis, medical aspects. Tinnitus is a perception of sound in the absence of an acoustic signal, a phantom sensation caused by the pathology of the ear or the auditory nervous system. Here when we say pathology of the ear, we mean all the three parts, the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And tinnitus in Latin means to ring. Well, most commonly, when we encounter patients with tinnitus, we always say there's nothing that can be done. Or sometimes we even dismiss their complaint saying, you just have to learn to live with it. Now both these statements are cruel and they are false because tinnitus is incurable but it's a treatable symptom. May not be through medicines and surgeries which have limited options but then definitely a reassurance makes, takes you a long way. Well coming to the demography of tinnitus. The prevalence rate of tinnitus is about 30%. So 30% of our population do suffer from tinnitus. But surprisingly, only 6% of them have an incapacitating and it increases with age. And if you look at the pediatric population, about 64% of them do have or do experience tinnitus. But surprisingly, only 3% complain. So when you have a prevalence rate of so high and only a few of them complain, then that means to say a lot of other factors play a role. So the factors affecting tinnitus are age. The age of the patient is quite important. As tinnitus occurs in older age group, you will see that it is kind of more annoying. Among the gender, there is a slight male predominance or people with or the male patients seek more of medical help rather than the female. So the Caucasian race complain a little more about tinnitus rather than the negroid species and socioeconomic status is sometimes defined tinnitus prevalence. Hearing loss definitely has a role and patients with hearing losses do experience tinnitus. Not all of them but a few of them. And noise exposure also affects tinnitus. So tinnitus is not a disease in itself. It is rather a reflection of an underlying disease which needs to be evaluated. So we need a classification or when we have a patient with tinnitus, now there are two groups of patients who can come to you. One with tinnitus associated with other otolaryngological symptoms and another sect of patients with only tinnitus as a complaint. So even your patients with sensory neural hearing loss do complain of deafness along with tinnitus. And your patients with external ear and middle ear problems do complain of deafness, pain, discharge, tinnitus, vertigo and all those things. So the neurite dilemma is to whom to treat. So first as you're talking to your patient, find out if the tinnitus is very annoying or many of the times the patients themselves tell you that it is so disturbing that I am not able to do my routine activity. And in some, it's not so troublesome, but then it is present. Only on questioning, they would kind of commit to it and say, yes, we do have to do this. So when it's annoying, it needs to be evaluated. So there are two causes. One is an organic cause and the other is a functional or psychogenic. But in medical practice, we would bar or kind of Name anybody functional only after we have ruled out organic causes. So that's very important. So under organic causes, you can have a peripheral tinnitus where the cause is in the ear. It could be external, middle or inner ear. Or it could be 
to the structures which are outside the ear but in its proximity like the eustachian tube or maybe the palate or the tooth under central causes of tinnitus we can have temporal lobe epilepsies and cerebrovascular diseases intracranial vascular tumors and vestibular migraine in temporal lobe epilepsies or central when you're talking about tinnitus you will have to make a clear distinction whether your patient has tinnitus or has auditory hallucination a simple question like asking the patient whether the sound is of the same type or it's a ringing sound or asking them to qualify the character of the sound will enable you or if the patient's answer would help you to tell you whether you have the patient has tinnitus or the patient has tinnitus plus auditory hallucination because for example in a maniac depressive psychosis he may have an auditory hallucination along with the tinnitus so then it becomes difficult for you to distinguish between those two so because they both are interrelated and both of them do need, do need medication and do kind of respond to medication certain systemic disorders also have tinnitus as their presenting symptom like for example somebody has anemia where there is less of blood so strychnine poisoning hypertension or even hypotension for that matter can give rise to tinnitus so as a treating physician it becomes important for you to find out what is the cause and after you have found out the cause and then probably you can kind of speculate as to where is the site so when we talking about ear we have the external ear the common complaints who come or present to you with external ear pathologies with tinnitus as a symptom it may not be the only symptom they may also complain of talking sensation so the common causes are wax in foreign body when you come to the middle ear you can have a range of pathologies like otosclerosis fluid in the middle ear or popularly known as non separator otitis media or glue ear glomus tumors arteriovenous vein malformations and inner ear pathologies like meniere's disease hair cell damages like in labyrinthitis or ototoxicity where anti tubercular drugs like aminoglycosides or salicylates or aspirin or loop diuretics may cause ototoxicity so the presenting symptom may be tinnitus that is why nowadays for treating tuberculosis or starting ATTs or anti tubercular treatment physicians have made it mandatory for the patient to undergo an audiometric testing before starting on multi drug regimen because these anti tubercular treatments would go on for months so your patient might develop ototoxicity in the whole process so a baseline assessment of his functions of his hearing is important so an acoustic neuromas presenting symptom may be tinnitus a noise trauma or an acoustic trauma which can result in auricular discontinuity or a labyrinthine concussions can also present to you with tinnitus Now, as we're going into the external and middle ear causes, the nice thing about the tinnitus originating from external and middle ear causes are usually they are treatable, and your patients and you feel nice treating those patients because they you feel like you've done a magic. But the problem is with the inner ear tinnitus. So first, we will finish with the external ear and middle ear. So I have a few interesting slides for you, so which we have in our clinical practice. So the first thing is the wax. so here wax as such should not cause you any tinnitus but whenever the wax is present and it occludes the ear canal the patient perceives a blocking sensation so the patient in order to get rid of the blocking sensation may use a spoon or a bud to clean it and in the whole process because he is doing it blindly and not under vision he might tend to push the wax plug deep into the canal and it might go and stick on to the tympanic membrane when it tinnitus would start and the blocking sensation would increase so such patients do present to us with tinnitus here the tinnitus is sudden in onset and it would be related to the cleaning process and it is sometimes it is painful because the patients try various methods of syringing or putting walking water into their ear to remove the block and wax you know is a hygroscopic so it absorbs water and so swells up and can give rise to more tinnitus more wax block and more pain so this is fairly simple and can be treated by wax dissolvents like paradichlorobenzene or dioxide sodium 
So we normally make use of a syringing or a microscopic suction clearance in such cases. Well, the other thing is otomycosis. Now this is a fungal infection. So I have a small video for you. So you can see the fungal spores. So you can see all that white specks, Aspergillus niger, then Aspergillus flavors and candida. So it's a mix of fungal infections. So tinnitus is associated with pain and discharge in this patients. So the treatment in such cases would be a good microscopic suction clearance, good analgesics and antifungal treatment and in such patients this is predominantly seen following people having bath in common pools and swimming pools or if they have a pre if they have a comorbid symptom like diabetes, otomycosis is common among diabetics. So you need to take good, along with these medications that we mentioned, we also need to take good care of the diabetic status. Now foreign bodies are a common thing that we see in ENT practices and foreign bodies range from animate to inanimate things. So you can have insects, you can have uh, seeds, you can have cotton ball, you can have rubber, you can have a whole lot of things. So these patients come to you with a short history and they themselves tell you that they did notice a foreign body in the ear. So we had one such case and so you can see that when the patient presented to us, the insect is still alive and you can see a portion of its leg is broken and so it's not able to move properly and so it's stuck on the tympanic membrane. Well, this is something that we encounter in our clinical practice almost every day. So in such situations, a removal and a microscopy is advised so if this happens in pediatric cases then we usually use a sedation because we want the patient to be lying down still when we are attempting to remove it otherwise it would injure the tympanic membrane so in such cases we would give a sedation or maybe a hypoventilation and remove the foreign body so the third thing is a foreign body this is common in clinical practice and this usually happens with adults who are old and who have ear discharge and sometimes it happens even in patients who do not have ear discharge but then have tinnitus and they think that the sound is coming because of the air entering from the atmosphere in such situations your patients would tend to put something into the ear So they would keep a cotton plug inside and most often sometimes it's forgotten or sometimes it is pushed too deeply. So the cotton plug is resting on the tympanic membrane. You can see portions of tympanic membrane here. So in such situations, we would visualize a foreign body there. So along with pain, they may even have tinnitus and a block sensation. So in such situations, it can be easily removed in the outpatient with microscopy. Now this is quite interesting. Sometimes, well, all of you, since I think maybe we have more of audiologists in the group and so you know that you have two muscles inside your middle ear, one is the tensor tympani and the other is the stapedius which take care of your acoustic reflex. So you can have a myoclonus, you know, a movement, smooth muscle contractions of these two muscles. So the tensor tympani usually will give rise to a clicking type of tinnitus. Well, I have a video for that. And the stapedius usually has a hissing or a buzzing kind of a sound. So if you see this. I keep observing. After I'm doing an autoendoscopy here. And if you visualize, can you see this? You can see the movement of the tensor tympani muscle. Okay. So which is transmitted onto the tympanic membrane also. So you can see the movement of the so this patient only had tinnitus and did not have any other complaint at all. Well, I have an object of tinnitus also for you. Now please uh, listen to the quality of the tinnitus and this usually with stencil. So you see it's a small child. So I'm sorry about the, this child never really allowed us to do a good endoscopy. So I couldn't get, I had to record both the sound as well as the 
video and so I ended up recording the video on the video and autoendoscopic monitor itself. So I see a normal tympanic membrane, but then there is that sound. I hope you people appreciated that. So the tensor tympani usually gives rise to a click and stapedious muscle spasm would give rise to a buzzing kind of tinnitus. In such patients, if you do a tympanometry, you see a sort of appearance. So since most in this particular child, the patient child was not even complaining. So there was no room for treatment at all. It didn't annoy him at all. But if some patients do have problems and they say it bothers them, then we do try to give them muscle relaxants, chlorzoxazone or anticonvulsants like carbamazepine. Okay, and in extreme cases, with the consent of the patient, because sectioning of tendons is an invasive procedure and, it, and it's an operating procedure. So we may even consider sectioning of the tensor tympani or the stapedius muscle. Now I did tell you that the eustachian tube or the structures close to the outer ear and the middle ear do have some role to play in the origin of the tinnitus and most commonly the eustachian tube dysfunctions. Now the eustachian tube like all of you are aware is a ventilating tube which is connecting the nasopharynx to the middle ear. So it is supposed to provide pressures inside the middle ear and it does not open always. It opens only when you swallow, when you are doing Valsalva maneuvers or when you are kind of sneezing or when you are doing any activity which raises the infrathoracic pressure. The eustachian tube orifice is guarded by muscles and has two cushion pads of lymphoid tissue around it. So if there is any problem with the lymphoid tissue surrounding the eustachian tube orifice or if there is a problem with the muscles which guard the opening of the eustachian tube orifice which are called as the levator veli palatini and the tensor veli palatini. So this the moment or the contractions of these muscles are affected then one can have a eustachian dysfunction which can manifest like tinnitus. Patients with allergy can have edematous lymph nodes or edematous mucosal tissue around the eustachian tube orifice and in such situations you can have an autophony, you can have deafness along with tinnitus. So this is the video of a patient with a chronic eustachian tube dysfunction. This again is an autoendoscopic picture so you can see the handle of malleus. So normally you do not see the lateral process so profound, it is not so prominent. But if the tympanic membrane is nicely retracted because of the negative pressure then the handle of malleus sticks out along with the lateral process and you can see the malleus fold and even the attic. Okay. So you can see all that. So in these situations, it is a classic case of eustachian tube dysfunction secondary to eustachian tube blockage. So if you address the tissue of eustachian tube blockage, then probably this patient is relieved of his tinnitus. Just like how you can have a narrow eustachian tube dysfunction, you can also have a patchless eustachian tube. So when you are having a narrow eustachian tube, you will have to look for congenital anomalies like a cleft palate or a submucosal cleft. You will have to do a nasal endoscopy to rule out masses like adenoids or tumors because if these are present, then they impair the eustachian tube function giving rise to a deafness as well as tinnitus. And like I said, allergies are important and the middle turbinate is in close association with the eustachian tube orifice. So in allergies, the middle turbinate will be hypertrophied and in such situations, we do try to give them steroid sprays which relieve them of their tinnitus as well as their eustachian tube function resumes back to normal and their deafness also disappears. So just like how I said you can have a narrow eustachian tube, you can also have a patchless eustachian tube. A patchless eustachian tube is where the eustachian tube orifies is open always and is unduly large. So such patients hear even their breath sounds and it is quite disturbing. I am sure most of you do not even hear your breath sounds. But in these patients, the breath sounds are heard like tinnitus and it bothers them. So these patients do seek medical help. So if you see a portion of the tympanic membrane which is closer to the eustachian tube, okay. So the eustachian tube is in this region. So you can see that it is synchronously moving with each breath sound. So in these situations, 
we will have to rule out neurological disorders because we will have to see if there is any atrophy of the levetoviridae palatinae or the tensor valley palatinae which are not closing the olfice of the gustation tube or is there any kind of weight loss which has with where the patient has lost the cushion pad of fat around the eustachian tube or has the patient undergone any kind of nasal surgery you know extensive nasal surgery is done for angiofibromas or maybe for polyposis of the ear in such situation it can give rise to scarring of the eustachian tube orifice so which keeps the eustachian which destroys the levetoviridae palatinae and tensor valley palatinae and so the eustachian tube is not able to close by itself and so would remain continuously open so it's quite disturbing for the patient to hear his own breath sounds but fortunately in these patients if we put some saline nasal drops and if there's an edematous mucosa it would respond to a saline nasal drop but sometimes what happens is to kind of narrow the opening of a patchless eustachian tube or a widely open eustachian tube we do try fat fillers also into the eustachian tube cushion but you should fill fat into the eustachian tube cushion but not to the eustachian tube so that will ensure that the orifice will narrow down so the patient's distressing symptom of tinnitus comes down to a great degree now while this most of you are aware of secretory otitis media or non secretory otitis media or popularly known as glue ear so here there is no infection as such but then there is a fluid present in the middle ear so you can get to see the fluid here keep your focus on this so you can see air bubbles and you can also see fluid levels here i hope you see so there's a fluid inside the middle ear so the common cause for secretory otitis media is depends on the age of the patient if you're seeing secretory otitis media in a patient who is young then probably adenoids have to be ruled out but if you're seeing the same thing in an elderly individual then you will have to rule out nasopharyngeal masses like polyps or malignancies and especially if it is bilateral secretory otitis media because nasopharynx is a midline structure so it would affect the eustachian tube orifice of both the sides so in such situations you can see it is the picture of the same patient who has the hair bubble and also the fluid so we done a grommet insertion i have done i put a ventilating tube here so we would do a meringotomy drain out that fluid and then put a we would put a ventilation tube because in secretory otitis media the middle ear mucosa has undergone changes because of a long standing fluid which was present there because middle ear should normally have air and not have fluid but in course of a chronic negative pressure the air becomes replaced by a fluid and in such situations we have to remove the fluid and ventilate the middle ear so that the mucosa reverts back into the respiratory epithelium so that you will have a normal functioning eustachian tube so in such situations we would do if it is a pediatric case we would do an adenoidectomy meningotomy and a grommet or a ventilation tube insertion if it is an adult patient and it's bilateral then we would do a nasal endoscopy and try and see or figure out if there is any nasopharyngeal kind of mass so chronic otitis media all of you are aware is an inflammation of the middle ear cleft and this can also give rise to tinnitus along with the other disturbing and other otological symptoms like ear discharge pain and vertigo and headache so you seeing a nice central perforation so you seeing the handle of malleus you seeing the eustachian tube orifice here you seeing the hypotympanic air cells and this is your promontory this is the handle of malleus so it's an inferiorly based perforation not occupying the whole of pars tensor because there's a good amount of pars tensor that's left behind okay in such situations for the same patient we've done a uh, a surgery like mastoidectomy with tympanoplasty we close the perforation so the tinnitus comes down considerably but here i would like to make a note that when we are taking informed consent for surgery we always had a note in the informed consent that the surgery is not being done for abolition of tinnitus it is only a by sequence or a by consequence of this of the surgery that the tinnitus will come down but if it doesn't come down completely or if it doesn't vanish then we cannot say that the surgery has failed because here the objectives of surgery was to clean the off is to get rid of the infection of the middle ear 
And second objective of the surgery is to realign or give back the hearing mechanism or a serviceable hearing as much as possible. So to make the middle ear totally septic free and then reconstructing of the ossicular chain. Or So here in such situations, the informed concern, we make sure that we add a line because these are all medical legal issues. So we always add a line saying that the surgery is not being done for the treatment of tinnitus and it is done primarily for the eradication of the disease and the reconstruction of the hearing ossicles. Well, it's very mandatory for you to counsel your patients because patients can have a lot of expectation. But what the surgeon can deliver is quite important and that has to be clearly spelled out to each patient. Now sometimes we also have total perforations of ossicles. Well, I put up this video just for you to see. Now this is like looking into the middle ear directly without it. If you didn't have it in panic membrane, this is how your middle ear would look. So if you see, this is all this autoendoscopic pictures. So we have autoendoscopy also. So this again, small child, okay? okay, so just look at it, how beautifully, the whole of parts size is gone, there is only a ring, and as I take the autoendoscope inside, you'll begin to appreciate the promontory, the incudose, pedial joint, the malleus, the stapes, the eustachian tube orifice, the round window, the hypotympanic air cells, and this is your oval window. So this is like seeing the entire so there is no, there is only the annulus, there is no tympanic membrane at all. There is only a portion of the tympanus placida. Otherwise the tympanic membrane is completely gone. So these patients, because the round window is exposed and they have all the ossicles, so they will all have tinnitus and the tinnitus means in such situations, it's quite gratifying for us to do surgery because the tinnitus comes down because we have, we would reconstruct the tympanic membrane as well as if the ossicles are not functioning, well, that also has to be replaced. In such situations, to know the extent of the disease, we have to do a high resolution CT scan and then plan it with a mastoidectomy with tympanoplasty. So, mastoidectomy to rule out the infective focus and tympanoplasty to reconstruct the ossicles. So, by doing this, the tinnitus would come down late. But, like how I said, Always take an informed consent that the surgery is not for tinnitus management only, and it is for eradication of the disease. So, well, this is tympanosclerosis, so most of you are aware of it. And just This is the meringosclerotic chalky white deposit on the tympanic membrane, and you can see an atrophic drum, a thinned out tympanic membrane. All of you are aware that tympanic membrane is three layer, but here you have just two layers and you don't have three layers. And here you have in between the layers a chalky deposit of collagen. So this tympanic membrane will not be moving so well with sound. So you also have a pathology in the attic also. So you see an attic retraction pocket which is badly retracted and perforated. So in tympanosclerosis, the prognosis is not so good. So because this situation is these patients do not present with ear discharge and they do not have, they complain mostly of deafness and tinnitus. So, hearing aids are recommended for this patient and the tinnitus has to be managed on the same lines as we manage tinnitus originating because of sensory neural hearing losses. So, we would be, we would try if the patient's concern or if the patient give you a concern then go ahead and do a good tympanoplasty with ossicular reconstruction. We will give them a guarded prognosis. So normally tympanoplasty or reconstructions are done with autogenous ossicles and we would also make use of cartilage grafts. Now this all of you are aware that otosclerosis is, in the fact, is a disease that affects the middle ear where the stapes gets fixed, the foot plate of the stapes is fixed. So this is usually bilaterally present and with a female predominance in the fertile age group of second decade to fourth decade. So in otosclerosis, most of you would have heard that patients have paracusis villisi and if you do an audiometry, they see a carotid notch. So you'll also have heard that they would have a Schwartz sign or a flamingo pink sign, which I'm about to demonstrate to you. So you can see here, you can see the ossicles and you can see the promontory filled with an active otospongiotic focus. So you will see, this is called the Schwartz sign or the flamingo pink sign, what you read in your books, okay? So it only suggests that there is an active otosclerotic or otospongiotic focus happening in the middle ear 
And so at the end of the day, you will have to do a surgery for them because it is fixation of stapes. But when the focus, rotospongiotic focus is so active, we try and give them sodium fluoride. So in such situations, we give them sodium fluoride, which brings down their tinnitus. And we provide time to do stepidotomy with teflon piston insertion because patient, this is an elective surgery, so patient is going to take time to decide. So in the meantime, we should also ensure that the otosclerotic focus doesn't kind of spread on to the cochlea. So that way the hearing gets more compromised. So we keep the patient on sodium fluoride 20 milligrams and then ask them to divide and come back for surgery. And if they're taking time to decide about their surgery, they must be kept on follow-up every two months. So we get asked them to come for follow-up every two months so that we can assess whether they hear hearing. At the same time in the counseling sessions, we make sure to tell them that this disease in some situations can spread to the cochlea and in that situation, surgery may not help and it's better for you to go for a hearing aid. So this is one more thing which I see in my clinical practice, traumatic perforations of tympanic membrane following assault and road traffic accidents. So, well, here also there is a perforation of the tympanic membrane, but the nice thing about it is it's not an infected middle cleft. I would say middle cleft because with the middle we also include the mastoid as well as the eustachian tube. So you can see bright red petechial hemorrhages surrounding and a ragged edges and tear of the tympanic membrane. It is not like that. Nicely defined perforation. So these are traumatic perforations of tympanic membrane. And traumatic perforations are conservatively managed. So your patients, you tell your patient that there is, since we have diagnostic uh, microscopy and endoscopy, we would educate our patient to show them that they have a traumatic perforation. But we also tell them, that we are doing an audiometry is quite compulsory in these patients because you have to know whether is it just the perforation of the tympanic membrane or is it the ossicles also have become discontinuous because the blast of air can kind of even dislocate the ossicles. So in such situation it becomes important to assess the quality, the amount of hearing loss and at the same time we will also have to plan for treatment. So tell these patients not to get it infected, keep on follow-ups, after four weeks reassess the perforation if it is nicely epithelizing and if the patient's tinnitus is coming down, keep on follow-up, there is no need for surgery, the perforation will close on its own. But even after three months, if the perforation is not closing, then that is the time to tell your patient that this membrane may not possibly heal on its own and so in such situations, if there is only tear of the tympanic membrane, we would plan a meningoplasty. But if there is a tear with ossicular disruption, then probably we would be doing a tympanoplasty, ossicular plasty. Another thing that can cause tinnitus is ossicular discontinuity. Now this ossicular discontinuity can follow a cost of following caustic trauma. So if you see the tin, look at the handle of malleus. Well, it is not normally like this. So you should be seeing the lateral process, it is dislocated with the incus here. So this is a case of ossicular discontinuity and this was following a deep diving. A person kind of, you know, common among divers and all they suddenly dive into a splash of water and the uh, so much of uh, barotrauma happens that the ossicular chain gets disrupted. So even in a caustic trauma following gunshot, it gets exposed suddenly to loud sounds like crackers. The tympanic membrane may not rupture, but then there could be dislocations of ossicles. So in such situations, it's important to do a meringoplasty or you know, to do an ossicular reconstruction is important. Well, again, the condition of the middle ear, which can cause tinnitus and is the glomus tumors, a paraganglionoma. And if you see, this is not like Schwartz sign. You can see a pulsation here. Can you see this? So you are seeing a pulsation. So this is a tumor of the middle ear, a glomus tumor of the middle ear, paraganglionomas. So this is quite a, a very vascular tumor. So do not attempt anything. Just do a plain autoendoscopy. You should be. This is a spot diagnosis. If you see it, you know it is glomus. So the rest of the things is only surgery for it. So to know the extent of the tumor, you have to do a HRCT scan or even an MRI should be done because the tumor. You can, can extend sometimes into the neck also. 
So the surgery has to be planned. Now here you can't do mass dry. You really have to clean. Uh, you have to do a tympanotomy and open up and then plan your procedure depending on the extent of the tumor. Another common thing that we normally see in our clinical practice is a high jugular bulb. You see a nice tympanic membrane and then you are also seeing a sinus. So the sinus fluid. So most of you do know that the middle ears floor is in relation with the jugular bulb. Some, it is nicely covered with a sinus plate or a bone covers it. But in some situations, there is so much thinning of the bone that the jugular bulb is transparent or seen like a, a thin slice bone. So the bone is here, but then it is very transparent so you can see the arch of the jugular bulb. And if you take a CT scan, see you can see it going into the... So this is the external auditory canal. Well, this is the tympanic membrane. So you can see it bulging into the floor of the middle ear. Now this is the middle ear. So you are seeing it bulging into the floor of the middle ear. So in such situations, you will have to be very careful. High jugular bulb will cause a lot of bleeding when you kind of encounter. So such situations we encounter during middle ear surgeries. Normally when you see a high jugular bulb, you also know that the tegment plate or the tegment tympani is lower down. So you have the meninges also, the sinus plate and a contracted antrum. So this kind of anatomical variations you would be seeing. CP angle tumors can give rise to tinnitus and CP angle tumors, I would put them as CP angle tumors because CP angle tumors are not just acoustic tumors, they also mean meningiomas and arachnoid cysts. can also happen in the CP angle, the site of the CP angle. So you see, there, so such patients present initially with a unilateral tinnitus and the retrocochlear kind of hearing losses. So here you know you'll have to do a HRCT scan and normally in CP angle tumors, the good thing about CP angle tumors is they're benign tumors and slow growing tumors. They would take decades to grow to a diameter from, if they are 